Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to uh, begin today um, by quoting a sermon that made a major impact on my life when I was in college. Uh, it was on this text that we're going to look at today in Galatians 6. Um, my story kind of coming to Christ, there's a lot of, um, I talk a lot about purpose and finding meaning, um, asking these questions, what's the meaning of life, why am I here? Um, and so when I came to Christ and I found that purpose, um, anything I would ever hear kind of related to that would always kind of resonate with me. So uh, there's a sermon again that I, I heard when I was in college by John Piper, you may know, and it was an event called One Day. Um, I actually did not hear the sermon live. My roommate and some friends of mine uh, were there, and they came back saying, there's this guy, I don't know who knew who he was, but he got there and uh, shared this, this sermon, and it was just incredible. And my roommate was, was so impacted by it, he actually ordered the DVD of the event, and we were watching our dorm room. So Piper, in this uh, sermon on Galatians 6, particularly Galatians 6.14, this was the basis for his book later called Don't Waste Your Life. He said this, You don't have to know a lot of things to make a huge difference in the world, but you do need to know a few things that are great and be willing to live for them and die for them. If you want your life to count, you don't have to have a high IQ or high EQ you don't have to be smart or have good looks. You just have to know a few basic, simple, glorious, majestic, eternal things and be gripped by them and be willing to lay down your life for them. Which is why anyone here can make a difference. There are hundreds of you out there today who do not want your life to make a difference. All you want is to be liked. Maybe finish school, get a good job, Find a husband or a wife, a nice house, a nice car, long weekends, good vacations, grow old, healthy, have a fun retirement, die easy, no hell. And that's all you want. And you don't give a rip whether your life counts on this earth for eternity. That's a tragedy in the making. I want my life to count. I want my life to count for eternity. I think our passage today speaks to that. Let's pray. Father, I give you thanks. Thank you that you're with us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these words we're going to look at today in Galatians. Lord, I pray that you would, you would speak through your word. You would, you would change us as we look at your word, we behold all that you have done for us, all that you have made us for, God. Help us to respond with faith and with lives changed. Lord, I pray for your help for me, God, help me communicate it well today. Uh, you know I need your help. I pray this in Jesus' name. All right, well, um, as has been mentioned, this is the last week in our series on Galatians. In the last 10 weeks, we've been going through this book. I started us off in that first week, kind of did the first 10 verses, uh, kind of introductory part. And then after that, uh, ben, ben took it for a while, for several weeks. And then the last couple of weeks, Jason Engel has shared with us. And now I'm going to be wrapping this up today. Uh, since this is the last week, I thought I'd just kind of briefly recap some of the ground we've covered. Uh, as a reminder, the, the title of the series was, was No Other Jesus. Um, and this awesome graphic that needs to sign, No Other Jesus. And then to give you a flavor of what Paul wrote in Galatians, I thought I'd kind of go over the, uh, the sermon titles. Uh, I'm not going to read through that list, uh, but you can see them there. Um, and kind of give you a flavor of what we covered, and the passages we covered, how we addressed those. You probably noticed there's a repeating phrase in the sermon titles, uh, no other phrase, and uh, that was by design. That's because Paul's letter to the Galatians is addressing a false gospel 
that creeped in had tried to add something to the gospel, add to what Jesus had done, uh, namely adding uh, adherence to Old Testament rituals and uh, such as circumcision. And uh, what they were saying was, you know, this is required for salvation to be made right with God. Basically saying that Jesus was not enough. Uh, but Jesus is enough, and that's why Paul wrote Galatians. Uh, because there is no other Jesus, not then or now. Paul drives this point home once more in our text today, which concludes the letter. He goes out with a flourish. One of the commentaries I read for this in preparation titled this section of the letter, The Essence of the Christian Religion, which uh, seems like a big topic to try to cover in one sermon, but I'm going to try to do that today. All right, I'm going to read Galatians 6, 11 through 18. You read with me. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cause of Christ, for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. And now all that no one calls me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Well, our passage today begins in a little bit of an odd fashion there in verse 11, uh, when Paul says, See with what large letters I'm um, uh, writing to you in my own hand. And I just want to address that briefly, what he's, what he's talking about there. Um, first of all, you probably need to know, up to this point, Paul probably had been dictating the letter to a scribe who was uh, recording what he was saying. Uh, it was pretty common in that day. But here in verse 11, he takes the pen from the scribe, and he starts writing it in his own hand uh, for these last several verses. Uh, this is kind of a way, again, to sort of uh, authenticate the letter. This is, this is from me. These are my words. These are my thoughts. You can trust. This is what I wanted to say, kind of like how we can sign a typed letter today to kind of put our seal of approval on it. So that's part of what Paul's doing here uh, in Galatians. We see him doing this in some of the other letters he writes too. Um, but there's a difference in Galatians because he has this phrase about seeing what large letters I write this with, which is a kind of strange statement. Um, and there's been some debate what that means, but most people think that what Paul is trying to say there is he's, he's really trying to say, hey, listen up. I'm about to say something really important. I want to, something I want to emphasize as he closes the letter, kind of the last words. These are the last things I'm going to leave you with to remind you uh, of, of what the gospel is. And, and that would make sense because Paul goes on for about seven more verses after he makes this statement. Uh, in most of the other cases, he, he includes that as the last line of the letter, the last two lines of the letter. But here in Galatians, he says this and then he goes on. So it does seem like he's trying to emphasize something. Which raises the question, what is Paul emphasizing? What is he trying, what does he really want the Galatians to get? Um, because if it's what he wants them to get, then it's probably something that we should be trying to get as well to understand. Alright, so we're going to go into verses 12 and 13. This is where he, he starts to get down to the heart of the matter. It's those who want to make a good showing in the flesh, who are forced to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. So Paul once again, uh, he wants to emphasize one last time uh, to, to expose these false teachers and the gospel that they were preaching, which is a works-based gospel based on outward rituals and certain you know, appearances. Paul goes a step further here, really. Um, he not only undermines their message, he also kind of questions their motives as well. So it's not just that their message was bad, it was their, their motivations were bad too. They want to make a good showing in the flesh, he says in verse 12. Uh, that, that phrase really means kind of they want to put a good face on it. That's what it really means uh, in the Greek. And the reason for doing this, Paul says, they want to avoid persecution for the cross. And one thing to remember here is that the, uh, the early church uh, was a persecuted church. Uh, and that persecution came from different directions came from the Romans, but it also came uh, from the Jews quite often. A lot of the early Christians came from a Jewish background. 
when they meet Jesus along the way to Messiah, they follow him. Um, this didn't always set well uh, with the Jewish leaders of the day. We see that in Jesus' story, of course. We see that in Paul's story. We see that in other parts of the New Testament. Uh, preaching that, that Jesus had met the demands of the law, and that the Old Testament, Testament sacrificial system and a variety of other things that had been added to the law in the centuries was, was no longer needed. Um, that was not a popular idea amongst the Jewish leaders. It kind of undercut some of their influence and their power, so they tried to suppress that um, and persecute the Christians who were spreading this message. So these false teachers in Galatians were trying to avoid this. They were trying to avoid that persecution. And uh, they wanted to show that they were, they were still being good Jews. They were still observing this ritual of circumcision. And so therefore, they don't, they don't need to be bothered. Um, they did this, again, Paul is saying, they did this because uh, people who preached this at the cross, preached Christ crucified, they were going to be persecuted. And Paul did this personally. He had experienced this persecution. He references this earlier in Galatians in, uh, in 511. He says, brothers, if I still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Um, and so the Judaizers were preaching circumcision to avoid persecution. And they wanted to make sure that those who might persecute them knew that they were doing this. That's why they were kind of, and verse 13 it says that they were boasting in the Galatians' flesh. They were trying to hold up these Galatians as a sort of a trophy. Say, hey, look what we've done. Look what we convinced them to do. We convinced them to be good Jews too, and these Gentiles. And so they're um, trying to boast in that, in that accomplishment. Um, they're really trying to show, show off the Galatians. And so on your bulletin today, there's, um, it says two kinds of boasting. And that first blank there is, is boasting in the flesh. And I put in parentheses there uh, ourselves, because that's really what they were doing. They are trying to boast in something they had done, um, and boasting in the Galatians' flesh, in this external act that they did. I want to kind of pause here and, and just um, ponder a brief point of application for us. I think when we read letters like Galatians, we might be tempted to read it from Paul's point of view and kind of read it as if we're on Paul's side. Um, we've seen throughout this letter, it's, it's kind of negative in tone. I mean, Paul loves the Galatians. He wants them to follow Jesus, but he is chastising them. He's rebuking them. Uh, he's saying some, some things that might be hard to hear. And so when we, we read the letter, we might be tempted not to see ourselves in Galatians, but really to see ourselves in Paul. Um, we think, we, you know, we got our theology worked out like Paul, uh, and so we're cheering Paul on in this letter. But what if we're more like the Galatians than like Paul? Or even worse, what if we're like the false teachers or the Judaizers in some ways? It's a question I had to ponder this week. Um, for example, do we ever change our message or soften the edges or omit certain doctrines uh, in order to make the gospel more palatable to people that we're around? Do we ever purposely downplay certain aspects of the faith uh, to appease people or uh, to kind of not ruffle any feathers? Uh, and I realize we're in a variety of situations, a different context, and discernment wisdom is, is definitely needed, but we can't, uh, we can't hide behind those things in order not to offend. Because uh, when we do that, we, we're in danger of twisting the gospel. Um, we're operating out of fear, which is the same motive that the Judaizers partly were operating out of was fear. The gospel will be offensive. Um, we know that. And we might, this could be an issue, I guess, because we look at our world today, um, something maybe we're going to be more tempted to do, to sort of water things down a little bit. Um, but I would just encourage us not to do that and hold fast to the truth. Um, there was a quote I read an article this week that said, The world does not need more cool, yet culturally savvy, irrelevant copies of itself. It's a temptation for us to be like that. We're going to be salt in life. So I think that's one maybe application we can have from this passage of Galatians. Um, before we move on to the next verse, I did want to show you a chart I designed here. Um, this is sort of, verse 13 is really the last time Paul addresses these false teachers in a direct way. And so I thought maybe at this point, just pause and look back on what Paul has said about these false teachers in Galatians and what the message that he's been preaching, how that differs, to kind of contrast these two. 
Uh, so you guys see false teachers. They were really focused and concerned about outward appearances, making a good show in the flesh as we see today. Paul, though, uh, was focused on inward transformation. It's going to work itself out, but really starting with inward transformation. The false teachers in Galatians were trusting rituals like circumcision to, you know, for the right standing before God. Paul, though, uh, trusting and putting his faith in Jesus. The false teachers were trying to avoid trouble, avoid persecution. Uh, Jesus, or <clears throat> Paul was following Jesus no matter the cost, only that he, he uh, was persecuted for that. The false teachers, they were changing, changing the gospel message, adding to it. Paul, though, was holding on fast to the pure truth of the message of the gospel. The false teachers were observing the law or trying to, and they were failing. They were trying. Paul, though, was walking by the Spirit. And this is uh, played out in certain parts of the Galatians. And then uh, the false teachers, they were boasting in the flesh. <clears throat> but Paul had a very different boast. He's boasting in the cross. As we look into uh, kind of the next part, uh, verses 14 through 16, this is where Paul starts to talk about this idea of boasting in the cross. And we've sang about that today um, a lot already. And Paul says, Far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision but the new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So that next blank on your insert is boasting in the cross. Boasting in the cross. We need to talk briefly about this word boast. Uh, it's a hard word to translate. Um, there's not really a good English equivalent to it. But it means something like to rejoice in, to revel in, uh, to exult in. One of, the, one of the commentaries I read mentioned is, is kind of like uh, something you're obsessed with, something that's really your focus in life. This is what you're counting on. This is, this is it. Um, and Paul says he's not going to do anything. He's not going to boast or rejoice in anything except the cross of Jesus. That's a really bold, strong, and, and a really strange statement uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, Jeremy kind of alluded to this in communion. One strange reason, one reason this is a strange statement is in the context of the first century Roman Empire, um, you know, the cross was a place of gruesome execution. It was a place of death. Roman, polite Roman society, they wouldn't even say the word cross on their lips. They would avoid saying it. Even the Roman courts, when they were uh, pronouncing a sentence of crucifixion on somebody, they would say, uh, hang the person on the unlucky tree. They would avoid saying the word cross. Uh, so it's a place of shame and humiliation. Um, and as others have said, our contemporary equivalent would say something like, I rejoice or I exalt in the electric chair. I rejoice in lynching. I rejoice in lethal injection. And you see how strange and weird that sounds to our ears. It would have sounded just as weird to say I boast the cross to, the, to Paul's readers. Um, and yet he says it. He not only says it, but um, this word that the rest of the Roman society was trying to avoid saying, Paul is proclaiming it in the streets and saying this is something we should rejoice in. So that's one reason it's strange. A second reason it's strange and a particularly strong statement for Paul to make um, was this word except. So <clears throat> man never boasts except in the cross of Christ, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, or say it positively, may I only boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus. It was a big statement for Paul to make, especially contrasting himself with the Judaizers who were saying they're going to boast in the flesh. And it's kind of ironic because we talk about boasting in the flesh and looking at credentials of people that might be able to boast in the flesh, not that any of us can. Uh, but Paul had a pretty good case, and certainly probably a better case, I would say, than these false teachers in Galatians. Um, and this is, he talks about this in Philippians 3. Which again, we've alluded to in our service today, but we have it up on the screen there. In Philippians 3, Paul says this. He says, If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but through which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So all these things that the Galatians were boasted in, uh, Paul, Paul counts them as a loss. Going back to our, our text today, the question is why? Why is Paul making such a statement? Why is he willing to forsake all these other sources of boasting in comparison to the cross of Jesus? What's the big deal about the cross? What happened at the cross? That's the really important question. Uh, Paul's boasting of the cross, of course, is not boasting in a physical piece of wood. It's boasting in the Savior who was nailed to that wood. The cross is where God accomplished for us what only He could do. It's where Jesus, the Son of God, laid down His life as a sacrifice for our sins. It's where our sins, your sins, my sins, Paul's sins were all paid for at the cross. Without Jesus' death on the cross, we're without, without hope. This is Paul's boast. This is why it's Paul, Paul's boasting on the cross. You may be a nice person, a good person relative to others. Uh, you may be avoiding different kinds of vice. You may be really involved in community, different social causes. You may be really involved in church. Um, none of, you cannot boast or allow any of those things before God in terms of your right standing with Him. You can only um, rely on Jesus and His sacrifice at the cross. So that's why Paul is saying his only boast is the cross. It's kind of like that, that song, Oh, Christ is solid rock, I stand on other ground, the sinking sand. That's what Paul is saying. Um, anything else that you trust and the most in, it's not going to cut it. It's only the cross. Moving ahead, in the, the next part of this verse, uh, and really in the next, um, next section of our outline, we see effects of the cross. Uh, Paul adds to this strange statement, he talks about, I'm going to boast in the cross by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So this next point in the bulletin um, will be a crucified life. A crucified life. So what in the world does that mean? Um, when Paul says a crucified life, uh, that he's been crucified to the world, the world has been crucified to him. He actually leaves us a few clues throughout Galatians as to what he means. So we're going to look at some of those, go back and kind of review. A couple weeks ago, Paul, uh, Jason preached on the last half of Galatians 5. And in that passage, Paul says this in Galatians 5, uh, 16 through 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Then he's Going ahead into verse 24, he says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I think that's one clue in terms of what Paul means when he says, I've been crucified to the world, the world's been crucified to me. It's crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Um, if it's prior to that, Ben, ben preached on Galatians 2, and probably one of the most famous verses uh, in Galatians is verse, uh, 2, verse 20. Um, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what does Paul mean in 6.14? He says, oh, the cross by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What does that mean? I think it means <clears throat> at the cross, Jesus died for my sins, Yes. He did, and, and now I've trusted in Him and what He's done for me at the cross. He is my Lord, He's my Master, He's my Ruler. My identity is completely wrapped up in Christ now. Um, my old self, the self ruled by sin, the worldly thinking, has been crucified with Jesus. Um, and so the world, and by world here, I mean the fallen world, the world, fallen world system, and godless values and uh, hopeless pleasures that the world offers. That world no longer has power over me. It's like when Paul says in Romans 6, 8, he says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. 
That's what a crucified life means. The world has nothing for us. We're no longer hypnotized by the world's power and influence. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a famous German Christian um, in the first half of the 20th century, kind of talks about this and sort of resonates with that scripture Jeremy read, uh, read for communion in Luke 9. Um, it's a long quote, so bear with you. I think it's pretty powerful and, and instructive of what it means when we talk about what it means to be crucified with Christ. He says, The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins, the cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man who bids him come and die. It may be a death like that of the first disciples who had to leave home and work to follow him, or it may be a death like Luther's who had to leave the monastery and go out to the world. But it is the same death every time, death in Jesus Christ, and death of the old man is called. Jesus summons the rich young man who is calling him to die because only the man who is dead to his own will can follow Christ. In fact, every command of Jesus is a call to die with all of our affections and lust. That's from the cost of discipleship. So as followers of Christ, you no longer have to think the way the world thinks or acts like the world acts, talk like the world talks. We've been crucified to that. We've been crucified to the world. We've been freed from that. Of course, as Jason said a few weeks ago, crucifixion was not a quick death. Um, we're still going to struggle at times with things here. We're still going to, our old, our old self, our old flesh is still going to fight. But it is in the death rows. Uh, and crucifixion was a sure death. So we need to know that. It's not just death. Uh, being dead to the world, Paul talks about, he doesn't end there. He has something really important and glorious to say in verse 15. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So the second effect for us in our bulletin, the second effect on the, of the cross is a new creation. The first effect was the death of our old sinful nature, our old way of living. Uh, but that death leads to a new life, a new way of living. Uh, just as Christ's death led to his resurrection. So it's kind of like... When we are baptized, people are baptized, often somebody, uh, when they're baptizing somebody, they'll say, uh, buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Kind of capture this idea that we uh, are sinful, uh, our sins have been buried with Christ, and now we are raised to walk for a new creation in Christ. It's an idea we see throughout Scripture. Uh, Jesus memorably uh, talks about this in John 3 with Nicodemus, saying, You have to be born again, you want to see the kingdom of God. Of course, Nicodemus has no clue what Jesus is saying. Um, Paul then says, uh, talks about again in Ephesians 2, talks about you know, we were dead in our sins, but we've been made alive together with Christ. And then he says, uh, talks about again in 2 Corinthians, uh, in a very well-known passage which we're going to read here on the screen. Uh, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 17, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the old the new has come. I was thinking about that this morning. Um, when we come to Christ, we are, spiritually speaking, made into something else entirely. We're a new creation with a new Lord, a new outlook, a new way of living. We're not living for ourselves anymore. We're not, able to boast, we're not going to boast in our flesh anymore. We're going to boast in Christ. Um, and this changes everything. This changes everything completely. Uh, coming to Christ doesn't just change your status with God, doesn't just change your eternal destination. It changes life. It changes every aspect of your life uh, from the inside out. You get a new heart, a new mind. Um, it starts on the inside, not through external rituals, not through ceremonies. Uh, but it, then it does work itself out again into every area of your life. Uh, the pastor once told me, he said, Chad, uh, Christianity is about, is about life. It's not just about life in a topical sense or compartmentalized fashion. It's not just about Sunday morning or mealtime. Um, it's about everything in a comprehensive, overhaul kind of way. 
is what needs to be a good creation. It is interesting in verse 15, uh, I want to point out something. Uh, it says, he starts that verse by saying, for neither circumcision nor uncircumcision uh, counts for anything. Um, quick Bible quiz, does this phrase ring a bell for anybody? If it does, you get an A on the Bible quiz. Um, that's because in, in Galatians 5, actually, Paul uses the same exact phrasing in 5 verse 6. He says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So in the span of 36 verses, Paul repeats this phrase, um, which makes me think there might be a connection between this faith working through love and new creation. So I think first it shows that this uh, new creation that we become in Christ, it starts, it starts with faith. It's activated by faith, putting our faith in Christ. Uh, you'll remember in Galatians 2.16, uh, which is some say the theme verse of Galatians. Paul says, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through what? Faith. Faith. Through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, so we've also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ. Uh, so we're not justified by works of the law, we're justified by faith. So faith is what um, starts our, our life as a new creation in Christ. And not only plays a role at the beginning of our walk, but it's needed throughout, of course, our walk with our journey with the Lord. Um, a few verses after that passage, or after that verse in uh, verse 16 in Galatians 2, at verse 20, we've already read this, but it says, you know, this life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Uh, so it's an ongoing faith as well. Faith is a big deal in Galatians. Uh, it's a crucial part of us becoming a new creation. Another connection, I think, between this five, Galatians 5, 6 passage about faith working uh, through love and uh, 6.15 where it talks about being a new creation uh, is someone who has been made a new creation will live a life of love. Selfless, sacrificial love is a mark of being a new creation in Christ. It's because we have a new nature, a new ability um, to love people the way God loves them, which is hard to do, impossible to do on our own. Um, it requires, um, it's only possible in Christ and relying on Him and dying to ourselves uh, to love people that way. Um, we can't do it our own. It takes God doing a regenerative work, transformational work in us. And he can do it and is doing it. And do it. So that's the second link. Uh, moving on to the final links of the insert there, um, some more effects of this new reality that Jesus has bought for us at the cross peace and mercy. We read verse 16. Uh, verse 16 says, And that's all for all who walk by this rule of peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. We really need peace with God and we need mercy from God. Um, the Bible says that we are, before we come to Christ, we're enemies of God. Um, we're rebellious, we rebel against Him. We deserve wrath. Uh, but through the cross, through what Jesus did on the cross, uh, we can now be reconciled. God, we can have peace. That relationship can, can be there. Uh, it's because of His mercy. The mercy God has shown us. We can have peace with God. Uh, that's another effect of the cross. Something we can be thankful for. Uh, just to point out here this word rule in verse 16. Um, you know, we talk in Galatians throughout here. It's, it's not by works of the law uh, that you might justify. I mean, you might think, well, why is Paul saying law by this rule? Rule and law in English, they kind of sound similar. Uh, the rule here comes from a Greek word that was used um, to refer to a carpenter's measuring line or a surveyor's measuring line uh, by which a direction would be taken. Uh, sort of like a standard by which to build something on, kind of a, a norm or a principle. Um, so for these false teachers, these Judaizers, their, their standard of are you in or out of the family of God was, you know, are you circumcised or not? Are you abiding by these uh, external rituals? But for Paul, the standard is everything we talked about today is faith in Christ and his sacrifice at the cross. Uh, we could meet the standard, so Jesus had to be it for us, so our faith in him um, allows that to happen. <clears throat> Paul finishes, I'm not going to go into the last two verses a whole lot, but just to say, verse 17, he says, you know, I bear my body in the marks of Jesus. He has been persecuted from the cross for the gospel. Um, and he doesn't want to have, hear really any more trouble coming from the Galatians or these false teachers. He's addressed it, and he hopes it's, it's done, done with. 
And then Galatians 18, he ends with a blessing of grace. He started with grace and he ends with that. Ends with the word of grace. Well, that's Galatians. Uh, we made it. Uh, I hope this was an impactful sermon series for you. Uh, it has been for me in preparation and hearing Ben and Jason talk. As we close today, I will pose uh, three questions for you to ponder in your application, application of how to respond to what Paul has said here. The first question is, where is your boast? Or another way of saying that might be, you know, what's, what's, you, what's getting you most excited about life right now? What are you rejoicing in? What's the driving force in your life? Is it Christ? Or is it something else? At the end of the day, um, we're only supposed to be in Christ and what he did for us on the cross. The second question is, are there areas of your life that you've not fully surrendered to Christ? It's kind of getting this crucified life uh, idea. If you're in Christ, then your sinful nature has been crucified with him, and you can have victory uh, in those areas. The third question would be, do you believe that God loves you deeply and can make you into a new creation in Christ? <laughs> Uh, originally worded this question, do you know that God loves you deeply and can make you into a new creation? And I realize that's, the, that's not right. Um, do you believe it? Because we can know something in our heads and not really believe it. Um, I hope you do. Um, if not, then uh, you can ask God to help you, help you with your own belief. I started with a uh, quote from Piper's sermon uh, about, you know, if you want to make your life count, I'm going to end with a, a quote from that same sermon. Uh, it really kind of addresses more directly the text. He says, All of life, if it is a boasting, is a boasting of the cross. You don't have to know a lot of things to make a difference in the world, but you do need to know that on the cross, Christ became your righteousness. On the cross, Christ took away your sins. On the cross, Christ bore your guilt and condemnation. You need to know that and then be gripped by it, and let your life be saturated by it. You need to know that everything you experience, everything that's good, and everything that's bad that God turns for good, was bought at the cross, so that you become only a cross boaster. We're about to this thing and finish our sermon, um, service. There will be people that can pray with you on the side if you would like to pray about any of this that's been shared or anything else going on in your life. I encourage you to do that. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can't boast in the cross. We can rejoice in what you have done. You have freed us. As we put our faith in you, have freed us and given us a new way, a new life, made us new creations in Christ. I thank you for that. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to fear. We are new creations with a new purpose, with the eternal purpose. Have us go out uh, this week and live in that. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.